All right, good morning, everybody. I see got a lot of people coming in. I got Justin here from Improve It 360. Hi, Mindy. How's it going, everybody? Hey, if you guys could just um, go into the either go into the question box, and if you can see us and hear us okay if you wouldn't mind uh, just putting a yes into the uh, chat box thank you Jason thank you Blaine John Mark Caitlin Trish oh wow Trish that's a great name it starts with stop but it's a great it ends with ski um, Joe David Brian Kara Jim Larry Mr. Larry, how are you? Long time no talk. Uh, Wesley, Ryan, wow, cool everybody. Glad you're all here. We will get started here in just a second. All right, Justin. Are we ready to go? I think we're ready to go, Brian. I think we are ready to go. We, people are still coming in, but you know what? They're late. Don't be late. No, I'm kidding. So, hey, um, I am um, excited about this. This is the first time that G4 Marketing has done a um, has done a webinar combined with Improve It 360. Um, I have a lot of clients that use Improve It 360, and uh, so this is awesome um, that uh, we're able to do this. And um, we're going to talk about a really cool subject here. We're going to talk about the seven sales and marketing profit multipliers, and um, we'll talk about how you can activate them in your business so that you can make more money. Um, say we got started I said we were gonna get started but I keep seeing the numbers of people like coming in and I want to give everybody a chance to get on but why don't we um, why don't we go here and kind of talk about what we're gonna cover here today and um, sorry Justin I'm doing a couple of like yep. housekeeping things here yeah, yeah, I know you're trying to get it set up. So, you know, just for everybody on the call, you know, Brian and I were, were talking a couple of weeks ago and reviewing these um, these seven kind of levers that you can pull. And as Brian was running through these, um, all I could think about was all of the um, examples, these use cases, these stories that we've come across uh, as we've uh, dug in and talked to, you know, some of our most successful businesses using our platform that we stay in touch with and um, <clears throat> there were just so many great sort of examples of either how uh, people are really really succeeding with some of these or maybe very specific unique um, angles that they're using uh, that we've tripped across and we thought it would be a great idea to kind of get together and not just you know talk about an overview of what these are and why they're important but um, again, give these real world examples from some of your peers or others in the industry <clears throat> uh, to kind of show you what they're doing and where they've they've seen success. So we're happy to do that today and glad everybody could join us. Yeah. Cool. So a um, couple of housekeeping items. Um, if you have questions, we cannot hear you. Everyone is muted except me and Justin. So if you have any questions, just put them into the question box and Justin and I will be happy to answer um, any, uh, um, any and all questions that you have. Um, I actually have a, a bit of a time limit today. Um, let me show you guys where I'm at. I'm actually sitting in the, I don't know if you guys are gonna be able to see this. I'm trying to turn my webcam around. Uh, but this is actually the room that we're going to be doing um, our big event, Accelerate, live um, in three weeks. Three weeks from today, actually, is, I believe, when we start. 
And uh, so we're here doing a site visit today. And that's why I got this funky wall behind me. And um, I may not sound as good, but uh, that's where we're at. We're really excited, Justin. We're about sold out. I mean, this entire room, it like goes all the way over to like to the other side is gonna be like packed with people. I think we've got uh, um, about 200 people that are coming out for that. So um, yeah, that's, that's really great. There's a lot of buzz around it. I've, I've talked to some other industry partners about it. So sounds like it's going to be a good time. Yeah, cool. All right, so let's jump into it. Let's go with this. So here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to introduce you to the seven profit multipliers. We're going to show you and talk to you about how to activate each one in your business. And like Justin said, he's got so much both of us have real world experience, but he's got, I mean, he's got the system with hundreds and hundreds of companies on it. So he's got some really killer best practices that he's going to share with you. And ultimately, our goal here is about helping you lower lead costs, sell more jobs and make more money. You know, lead costs are not getting any uh, cheaper or less expensive, I should say. They Every year they're going up. And so part of what we're going to be showing you here today is all about how do you maximize the value of each and every lead that comes into your business each and every lead that comes into your business all right so here they are and um we're going to walk everybody through see each the, uh, one of these. It, brian i just want to be sure can everybody see the powerpoint screen maybe it's just on my my end can I'm you not, not Seen it. Oh, hold on. Wait, wait. It would help. Oh, it would help if I turned on sharing. There we go. Yep. Yeah. So these are the slides you missed. That's me and Justin over there. This is what we're covering today. So here we go. So these are the multipliers. So what's really cool about, about these is that they all work with each other. And it's basically taking the customer journey that lead a uh, life cycle and maximizing the value of it. And what this does is, for example, if you, any tweaks, any improvements you make to any one of these areas actually helps you in multiple areas. And you'll see how that, how that works here in just a minute. So let's get started and let's just jump right into the first one, which is increasing the number of inquiries that come into your business. And, you know, real quickly, what I want to say here is an inquiry is not necessarily a lead. It's our job to now, if, when, when a, that inquiry comes in, whether it's a uh, a phone call, an inbound phone call, it's a web lead, it's a show lead, uh, or, or, or a, a, a card or something that was filled out, or a card that was filled out with canvassing, that's an inquiry. The job of, uh, of here is to bring in as many, obviously, as we can at a um, rate that makes sense, you know, at a cost that makes sense. So, Justin, I'm, this thing, every time I touch something, it goes out. So some of the ways to do this, and Justin's going to take over here in just a minute, is how do you more effectively um, execute on lead generation? So like, for example, I'm a, I'm a big ad guy. I love um, on, offline um, print media, newspapers, magazines, um, any of that stuff. I love that stuff. And one of the things that I know is that when you make tweaks and improvements to the quality of the ad, it improves the performance, right? So if you change a headline or if you have a better offer, that makes an improvement to the number of inquiries, um, obviously, that that ad produces. The other thing to think about, too, is having a better marketing mix, not relying on any one source of leads. I know a lot of companies that are, well, we're canvas companies. Well, what happens if canvassing dries up? What happens if a law comes into effect where you can't go knock on people's doors anymore? You don't want to be stuck with any one thing. And then the last thing here, which we'll talk about 
kind of at the end is how do you generate more word of mouth? How do you get more referrals, more repeat business? That's something that people don't think about when they think about inquiries or lead generation. So Justin, I'll let you kind of take it over. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. You know, this topic is one that um, has been covered so much in articles and webinars. And, um, you know, everybody's kind of looking for a, a silver bullet. You, we all know that leads or inquiries are sort of the lifeblood. I was trying to think of what is sort of an important impression to leave everybody with. And I see you got my slide, Brian, with the spaghetti. So that's great. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but as a, as a marketing guy, so I'm, I'm a CMO and I'm in, the, I'm in the tech industry and specifically the home improvement industry. Um, we have a lot of partners, a lot of integration partners uh, that, that work with us in our system. Uh, as the marketing guy, the question I probably get asked the most often um, when I'm talking to a client or a partner is my opinion on you know, various lead providers uh, or marketing companies in the industry or lead generation strategies. Um, basically where to get new leads, right? Or inquiries and ones that don't suck, right? Real leads, quality leads. Um, and it's not an easy question to answer because the answer is always, it depends. There is no silver bullet. Yes, we get a lot of feedback and insight here into these various services and strategies, but the feedback varies. You know, it varies from customer to customer, from region to region, from product to product. Um, and even from year to year, as things change, because, you know, performance on these various marketing channels change over time, they have new flow. Some of them are cyclical, right? What goes out of style suddenly is new and trendy again, and it works. And so what advice can we offer here? Well, the trend that we see um, is that most businesses, they want to try new things when it comes to generating new inquiries and leads, but they're afraid to. It's an investment decision, right? It's time and money that they're spending. And if it doesn't pan out, then ultimately it feels like time and money wasted. And we all have very little time and money to waste. So they can't just throw something to the wall and see what sticks, right? But the advice I typically give people is you can throw something to the wall and see what sticks. In fact, many of the successful kind of growth-oriented companies that we see, they do just that. Because you can, as long as you have data, is what I would call it, a safety net, right? So if you're able to report on the tangible performance of a lead source, the number of leads, the quality of those, the number of set sales revenue, and you're able to calculate an ROI in real time, that's the safety net that many successful companies are using. Real time is sort of the kicker, though, because um, it has to be this information that you can access immediately and see those trends immediately. If you're looking at an end of year report every 12 months, it's already too late to make you know those impactful decisions with your marketing dollars. Um, I've heard many owners and marketing managers say, uh, I'll try anything at least once, right? And they do, they, they actually will. Uh, they've tried about everything that's out there. Um, and then they quickly invest more into what works and less into what doesn't. So, you know, again, we've seen that companies that usually have growth traction issues are the ones that are a little too frozen in what they're doing today with their marketing strategy. And because things change so rapidly, um, they miss the boat on a lot of opportunity. Um, the successful companies tend to keep track. They're constantly adjusting spend or completely dropping lead sources. If, if they become less viable than others. So this is how we see these successful companies squeeze the most out of their marketing dollars, Brian. Um, yeah. There's one company I, I was thinking of in particular that, um, to your point about kind of the cost of these things, um, they thought they were doing pretty good on sort of the average cost per qualified lead. They were kind of on par with what they heard the industry standard was. Um, but then they really started to put this principle I'm talking about into play and keeping track and making adjustments religiously. And they said that they drove their average cost per lead down by about another $75 per lead, which is significant. Um, and I just, you know, the last thing I'll say on this, this topic, Brian, is that uh, you mentioned a good mix of channels to generate inquiries. That is something that is especially important when a recession inevitably hits um, because you'll find companies more rapidly adjusting during those times. So I think a, a great mix is always important. 
um, because you're always keeping tabs and adjusting for performance. But again, when that recession eventually hits, those sorts of adjustments become the sorts of decisions that um, you know will make or break a company during those those tough times. So if I leave yeah. you with one thing, just remember that spaghetti on the wall. Uh, it's it's not impossible. You 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 can. That is a sound strategy when it comes to inquiry generation. Well, and one of the really important things here, and and, and it goes through it, it goes through all of these is the most successful people in this business know their numbers. They know their numbers inside and out. And so, like you were saying, you were saying before, they'll try something, but they're not just, you know, they're not doing it like this. Most people, this is what they do. They just throw spaghetti at the wall and it's like, they don't even know if it's working or not because they don't have metrics and measurements in place. They don't know the numbers that they started with. You know, in marketing, you, you know, you and me call it a control piece, right? Just as an example. So if we've got our, if we're gonna do a newspaper ad, let's say, well, we have our control piece. We know that our control piece produces five leads a day or a week or whatever, right? Then when we go and we now test something different against it, we know, okay, the number to beat is five. And so if it does it, great. If it doesn't do it, then you go back to the control. And you only can do that when you understand the numbers. And by the way, that's going to be true with all seven of these, these multipliers. And that's where something um, that's where something like Improve It 360 comes in because you gotta know, you gotta understand in an instant what your what's producing, what lead sources are working, and at what costs absolutely so, i think the principle applies it, it could it could apply to all these points uh as you said brian but um i just thought it was so apt here because it, it is sort of the one consistent trend we see with these very successful high growth companies is that they are very comfortable with the fact that this mix is is going to constantly be iterating in terms of where they put their their dollars um um, and it, not just the channels themselves, but it, as you said, as you kind of test various uh, pieces or messaging within the channels, it's that same data, the same reports that are going to show you historically what's working and what's not. Yeah. Hey, Justin, this is kind of driving me nuts. Um, sorry, everybody, but I'm having a bit of a technical difficulty um, and that every time I go to answer somebody's question, you the, the video just pops out. So if I leave it like this, um, if I leave it like this, it's not gonna do that. So I think everybody you can still see that. my yeah. screen. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, next thing. And now this one is critical. This one to me is one of the uh, most important ones, and that is increasing the number of appointments from your inquiries. So this is something in my home improvement companies that I agonized over, and I use that word to be dramatic, but it, it, or it is dramatic because to me it was. It was that important because I knew, I mean, we'd get 50 phone calls on a Monday morning, so I knew that that if I just got a little bit better, just a little bit, if I could convert one more um, person into an appointment every day, think about that, five days a week, that's 20 a month, that's 240 a year. If my close rate's 30 or 40 percent, right? 30 30 percent on 200 on on 200 leads, that's another 60 sales. So it adds up to real money. And um, what I what I contribute to and what I say about this is the, the the best companies here understand how important it is to script this portion of the business uh, or, uh, of the of the life cycle, if you will, um, 
that their people understand that they're not there to sell a job. They're not there to sell the company. They're there to um, set an appointment, to sell the appointment. And that's what they're there for. And the best companies understand this. And um, that's how they that's how they execute on this. Um, so, you know, from my experience here, scripting is key, training is key, listening to the phone calls is key. You've got to have somebody that's that's looking over this and making sure that it's happening the way it's supposed to happen. Justin, I'll jump to you. Yeah, so, you know, it, with this topic, again, just looking for something, a new angle or, or something kind of new to think about in this area, um, I wanted to talk about some upcoming trends that we've started to see or that we think are going to happen, right? Um, so, obviously, you know, you talk about phone calls. They're the most preferred way of setting appointments today, and, you know, a lot of companies hone that script, that message very well. Um, Recently, we've seen, and, and maybe there are people on the call that have noticed this, um, services being made available to set appointments, right? And so essentially, again, I mean, some of you might use lead providers as part of your marketing mix. That same provider might have a service where they're selling you an appointment versus a lead. Um, and so where this comes into play, where we've seen it come into play, is when you've got a company that's still a little bit smaller, they're starting to scale, they want to get over this hump, they're starting to flirt with the idea of maybe a call center, um, and they might, they might look to this as a way to achieve what they want. I mean, typically, these companies that offer these services, you know, they're going to want your script. They're going to, they're going to adapt to uh, the way your process and the way that you handle it. Um, some of them offer more supplemental, you know, like an after-hours uh, if your current operations uh, only cover a certain amount of hours and somebody calls an after, there is an after-hour service that can actually schedule calls uh, for your business. Um, it's certainly not going to suit everyone. Um, I, I would I'd actually like to see if anybody's uh, had experience or used those services, um, throw it in the chat. I'd, I'd love to, to know about that or, or email us afterwards. But, um, but then even moving a little bit further out, uh, every once in a while, you, you'll read an article or uh, you'll, you'll see a service that's trying to provide a way to bring the entire sales process online, right? They're trying to e-commerce home improvement. And I personally don't see that happening in the very near future, but what I, you know, there are a couple companies that I think have started with that model, sort of their sole model, and they've had various success with certain specific products. But I, I think what we will start to see here are tools where homeowners can at least set their own appointments because there, are, there will be intelligent integrations between you know, your scheduling system and some sort of an online tool or a form on your website or, or something like that. Um, I think the major hurdle for introducing this process in earnest though, is that that initial phone call that you were, you were talking about, Brian, there are other things happening aside from just scheduling a date and a time, right? Particularly, I think of qualification, right? Um, yeah. and, and some other kind of preparatory conversations that you have. Um, but I think that, again, where the industry is eventually going uh, to capture these very serious consumers that want to start the process right away and they're used to this in sort of other markets, um, there are going to be some smart ways to bring some of that qualification process online. It's hard to think about today, um, but I think we're going to start to see some of these uh, because, again, it's just following a trend that you see in the consumer market in general, and some of those things will eventually start to leak into the, the home improvement space. So, you know, it's not suddenly going to happen tomorrow, but I think that that's kind of the part of the sales process that you'll see start to migrate online, you'll, be, you'll see some neat options and tool sets that are out there. Yeah, I, I, you know what's funny is I, I never thought that anybody would be able to pull this off, this outsourcing of, of, um, of phone calls. It, you know, it's one thing to have an answering service. It's a whole nother thing to have a company that is actually taking your calls and setting appointments for you. 
And um, I know there's I know there's a few people out there that are doing it, and um, seems to be you know seems to be working. You got to be careful though, um, obviously, because you know leads are the lifeblood of your business, and you're basically going to be relying on somebody else to do the work for you. I think you're always better off controlling that process yourself, especially this one because it's so important. And um, yeah, so that's that's great info. Absolutely, absolutely. Like I said, I'd, if any, if anybody's on the call here and they've had experience with that, would love to get their their feedback. Um, it is an interesting trend. Again, like you, Brian, we've we've heard a few use cases of people using them successfully. It's it's not making sweeping changes, um, but would be real interested to hear what others think. Okay, there is a here. There's a comment here. The goal of so many appointment setters is to set an appointment, but not to qualify the lead. I find most people who try these services complain about an appointment setter not simply understanding all the variables to accurately qualify the lead. Well, that, that comes from a from uh, Brian, uh, another Brian, and um, I think that that part of that is probably a, a scripting problem. And um, because it's not the qualifying questions are not being asked. Um, and then it's also probably a training issue because you're just not training people um, to do the to do it the way that you want them to do it. That's just kind of my absolutely. Two I, you know what I would caution people if anybody starts looking into this is there are services that are generic and there are services that are just for our industry, right? If you if you are using a company that serves just the home improvement industry, rest assured, the reps uh, that are serving our sole industry have a lot more experience in general. And then as Brian's saying, I mean, you really have to do your due diligence to make sure that they're gonna be following uh, your script and, and your process uh, before I would even attempt to, to try those. But again, we, I mean, from, from the ones that we've seen, they, um, they claim to do just that, and we have heard of some successful use cases. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. So let's go to the next one here, increasing the number of demos or increasing your sit rate or increasing your <laughs> presentation rate. Um, lots of different names for this one, but it's basically, um, you know, the appointment's been set. It's been issued to a salesperson. And now you want to make sure that that appointment is actually run, that the parties are there, and that your salesperson has been able to get inside the door. Um, that's kind of a, a big issue is just getting in the door. And so some of the things that I, uh, you know, that my clients do here to increase the number of demos, and, and this is one of my favorite things, is pre-positioning by sending out an email, or even in some yeah. cases a package. Okay, I'll put the package aside for a second, but sending out an email with a picture of the salesperson that's gonna be coming to the house. And just to kind of a short description on, you know, here's what you need to do to get ready for us and here's who's coming out and that goes a long way to you know building trust um eliminating kind of the oh my god who's going to show up at my door issue um you know people are leery about letting strangers into their house so the more you can do to make them comfortable with that the better your chances are of uh, having that appointment actually successfully run. The other thing too is confirmation is so important. I think Justin, are you going to talk a little bit about confirmation? Yeah, yeah. That you know, I don't have a whole lot to cover on this topic, but that was, I think, one of the points. Um, and yeah, we we could talk about that a bit. Um, and I won't I won't dwell on this too much because I have a lot more to cover in other points. But yeah, I, the one thing I think of right away here is a confirmation process. You know, thinking about that if you don't do it today. Um, what, what we're seeing right now is that, you know, this used to be kind of a phone only thing. Um, slowly, almost too slowly, our industry has started to uh, adopt texts, which we're used to in almost every other area of our life, right? Um, it, it's bizarre to me that I, I don't get text confirmation sometimes now if I'm 
going to the doctor or the dentist or, you know, whatever. So um, it's so prolific. Uh, texts are very popular. Um, it's a great way to automate it and, and potentially have less overhead, you know, than people confirming by phone. We, we see people, some companies have used a mix, and we've seen some companies have said, you know what, text works so well that they got rid of most of their, their phone confirmation process. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're going to, if you confirm appointments, you're going to see your sit rate go up. That's just a, a did, fact. And, and you'd mentioned did, did, pre-positioning. I think these things kind of go together. Confirming, yeah. but also just the automated messaging that comes along the entire sales cycle and everything you can do with that. That sort of bleeds into to our next topic that I want to talk about um, because you get so much out of that pre-positioning message before the, uh, before the appointment. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you say that people are getting away from using the phone to confirm? So I, I would say that, you know, originally that was solely what they did, right, was the phone. Yeah. Um, but there's been a lot of adoption with texting lately. Um, yeah. Typically, they will, they will do it in tandem, right? And sometimes, they'll, they'll, sometimes it will be a reminder. Sometimes it's actually a confirmation where they're asking for confirmation back. Um, some, we've seen processes where if they get the confirmation through text, they don't bother with the phone calls. And we've seen certain, certain companies that say that the text works so well um, that they really eliminated what they were doing on the confirmation call side or, or brought it down to close to zero. So, you know, it's, it's going to vary uh, depending on your rate of, of success. But text, texting is being adopted like mad right now. For this and other areas along, you know, moving you along guys, the sales pipeline and into the customer life cycle. Yeah. Is there, um, is there texting through Improve It 360? Uh, yeah. So it's a service. Um, it's kind of an add-on service because there's a back-end component to it. It depends on the quantity of texts. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. That was something we introduced a while ago. And um, okay. it's, it's certainly had a lot of adoption. It's kind of an easy... Um, yeah, easy thing to, to implement and consider. Yeah, I've got I've got a, a buddy in the business, Mark, um, at at um, at Marlamar, that um, yeah. does this also. I mean, his the whole platform is just texting, and um, the results are are amazing. I mean, you, you if you're not using texting right now. Um, to confirm appointments and communicate with your customer during the process, you're missing out. Um, this is more and more, it's interesting, it's more and more, it's becoming the preferred method of, of uh, communication, which is a little scary. Um, I don't think the phone's ever, ever going to go away. Um, but texting, if you're not doing texting, you're re really, really missing out. All right. So let's go to number four, increase the number of sales. By the way, there's a lot of chat activity. That's why I'm a little, I'm, I'm looking over here. I, I see these uh, um, things coming in. Let me see, let me just see if this is a question. Um, I am wondering, this is from Jennifer. I'm wondering if you expect that the leads which are setting appointments online are actually ready to move forward with a project. I would expect those people setting online without speaking with a representative are higher in the funnel and not quite serious yet. I would be curious to know what those who have used this type of appointment setting have experienced. I don't know, do you have any, yeah. um, do you have any data on that? Tire kickers, right? So we don't have data on it. And really, we don't know a lot. Of, so the use cases that are kind of flying around in my head are if there's a national brand, right? If, if you're somebody that um, offers a, a national brand, I won't name any, but if you, you know, and they have a national lead gen program, um, they might potentially, through certain avenues, provide appointment setting as well, right? Um, and those are, those are mostly custom solutions. Um, and they work a little bit differently than I think what would work better for an individual business where um, could, could you're, you want to serve up to the homeowner the times that are available. The times that are available might be determined by what they're interested in. And, you know, there's, there's sort of these filter criteria that you would have your call to, or your, your person answering the phone 
they would know these things would be part of their consideration when scheduling. Um, and, you, and all that needs to be baked into the sort of the integrations and how it works. Um, so, no, I mean, but I think that this, you know, she's asking, or she's talking about the very sort of uh, the issue that I had referenced before, right, which is that you do so much more qualification and kind of an understanding of where they're at, and you're not just allowing anybody, you know, Joe Schmo, who knows what he wants to fill up a time slot in your salesperson schedule. So I certainly understand the concern. And, and, and that, is, that is the sort of hump, along with sort of the technology integration side, that needs to be tackled before it becomes very viable. But there are people working on it. I think it's, it's been talked about for so long. Um, it's, it's going to be here. And it's certainly going to be here before, you know, the entire sales cycle moves online, right? It's, it's going to happen in steps. And I think that's one of the first steps that you're going to see um, start to happen. Um, you probably have I, already seen it or you'll start to see it for those people on these larger, you know, um, uh, network sites uh, that, that provide homeowners, things like that, right? Yeah. All right. So let's move on to number four, um, which is increase the number of sales. So we've set an appointment. We've issued it to a salesperson. Salesperson has got themselves in the door. The salesperson is now going to make a presentation. How do we get them to close a few more sales? So um, there's a couple of things I'll, I'll throw in here. One is you got to have a selling system, a selling system. And I would imagine that most of you on the call probably do. Um, but without a selling system, you're leaving this to chance and you can't leave this to chance. The other, the other piece of that is when you do, when you have a selling system, then you can train your people on that selling system. You can do ride alongs. You can do all sorts of things because everybody is playing from the same playbook. And this is one of the things that I see, especially in the smaller companies, the owner still out selling. First thing, you shouldn't be selling. You know, if you're the owner, you need to be running your sales team. And you can't teach your people that you hire how to sell like you do. I can't teach somebody to sell my stuff the way that I do. It's just not possible. So I have to have a selling system that helps them to, to, to sell. Um, some of the other things too is, you know, you want to think about financing. If you're not offering financing, you want to offer financing. Um, you want to do what you can to minimize cancellation. So one of, you know, there's a few things that you can do and, and it's really entirely around customer experience. So once the, the job is sold and buttoned up that night, is there some action that happens immediately the next day or does the contract just go back to the office and get lost? You know, and then a week later they get something. You want to get on that right away. You want to say thank you. You want to say welcome. And then you want to set up if you do a measure or whatever, you have to go out and, and, and re, you know, get the exact measurements of the windows or the roof or whatever you're doing. You want to just boom, engage with that new customer right away, make them feel welcome and, and, and engaged. And then the last thing I'll say here, we're going to talk more about it at the end. It's kind of my area or specialty area, but think about the type of lead and the difference it makes when you're sitting in front of somebody. So, you know, I, I do this thing all the time when I'm, when I'm speaking, I have five leads, right? I have an internet lead, I have a newspaper lead, I have a repeat customer lead, I've got um, a, a canvas lead, and I've got a referral lead. Which one do you want first? And invariably, everybody wants the repeat and the referral. Well, why? Because those close at a significantly higher rate than a cold lead, an internet lead, a canvas lead, or a home show lead, right? And so the type of person you're in front of is also something that's going to help raise your close rate. So, Justin? Yeah, so I've got a few use cases. And Brian, I'm, uh, you might have to share your screen again. I think it, there we go. Um, 
You know, I've got a couple use cases that came to mind here, a couple specifics in general. Uh, first of all, back to the pre-positioning emails. Um, a lot of people are doing this now. You know, you set an appointment, what's going to happen? Boom, that person's going to get, you know, could be an automated email that goes out. What does the email contain? Um, it has educational materials about uh, the products. Um, some of them will do, you, you know, they'll, they'll have a photograph of the rep that's coming out to, uh, to, to the appointment, uh, to the in-home appointment. Um, they may be toting this month's special program or a sale that's going on. The point is to get the homeowner engaged and more comfortable before the appointment happens. And it's, to, you know, so they're not caught off guard by some of the things that they could use as objections if they were just first getting the information from the rep and they're more informed. They're further along the process. Um, there was a company that told us that they added video to these. They were doing these for a while. They added video to the pre-appointment emails and it just the video had a noticeable impact on their close rate. We're a huge, huge fan of video here at i360. It is, I can tell you, we're, we're stat junkies. We track everything. Video is absolutely the most engaging thing you can do on the digital side of things. People will just They'll click on your video um, more than, than anything else. Um, there was this old remodeling magazine article that mentioned a statistic about uh, consumers who view video are 64% you know, more likely to buy. I don't know if it's 64%, but there is certainly truth in that. I mean, we, we've seen it every day and we see it from our customers too. Um, an another couple of specific use cases, Brian, uh, not that long ago, spoke to a company that does bathroom updates and remodeling. Um, and they had really great real-time data of the result of every sales appointment. Um, you know, they had their salespeople resulting these things out in the field. It was all real-time. And they did a lot of reporting. And they looked at their sales efficiency reports and started to slice and dice them in these different ways to see if there were trends. Um, were certain reps better with certain types of leads? Were... Was it related, you know, if so, was it related to lead source? Was it related to the product line? Um, and the answer in this business was yes, they were absolutely trends. And so they said, we're going to change the way we schedule. And instead of booking reps immediately, we're going to start booking for available time blocks. And then the assignment process is going to happen the night before, after all the blocks are filled up and judgment calls were made about which reps get which type of lead. Um, they thought it would have an impact on close rate. It had a significant impact on close rate. It, it went up dramatically. And, um, you know, there were sort of pros and cons about that decision. Uh, but again, ultimately, it's kind of the numbers speak for themselves. So this change, along with some other efficiency gains that they had with just their scheduling system, um, was the crux of what eventually became 100% year-over-year growth within within a year. Um, wow. Just amazing. It's just, it's just these simple little switches. Um, the last one that I would guess not a lot of people are doing today, but we've seen a lot of success in with companies that use it, um, is this sort of this opportunistic mentality with the people that are out in the field. Um, so, you know, there's mobile technology out there where if, if I'm a guy that's out in the field, I could do a certain search if I've got a database of CRM and it'll search for records in the system that are within proximity to where I'm at, right? Um, and they could, you know, they could search by various stages in the sales cycle, canceled appointments, no-shows, past sales, outstanding quotes, um, and they just pop up as pins on a map, right? Um, so if a rep somehow ends up having time to kill, uh, because, you know, there was, they finished up an appointment early or the appointment didn't show up, whatever the case may be, they can use these tools to find opportunity within the area, call them up and kind of do, you know, like one of these pop buys, right? And sometimes it could just be to follow up on an unsold quote. Um, sometimes it's just a friendly sort of post job follow up, see how their experience went, but then they're going to capture referrals or they're going to capture testimonials. Um, there's one company in particular, it's a successful uh, kind of do window treatments and blinds. They have their reps use this all the time to increase the efficiency um, of sort of the day to day, because as much as they've kind of efficiently stacked their salespeople and done that on the scheduling side, it happens. It's always going to happen where um, a sales rep is going to have time and rather than twiddling their thumbs, you know, and they love it because 
the company is providing them tools to be more successful and they, they do yeah. want to be more successful. Your good sales guys will leverage it. Um, so yeah, that's just I, I a think, neat little uh, piece of technology that makes it possible. Yeah. That that's a that's a I have clients that that do that. It's part of their thing. Now, unfortunately, you know, the 80 20 rule applies. Only 20 percent of your salespeople are going to do it. But man, the ones that do it, they're the ones that are out there. They're they're aggressive. They're making money They're it, It's an uh, it's an untapped opportunity that a lot of people just don't want to go after. And that's that's kind of a shame. Yeah. You just have and to serve it up to them because it has to be done in a smart. It has to be done in a smart way. Well, and if, if well, yeah, you, you serve that sort of opportunity up with a click, you're right. You're absolutely right. The aggressive salespeople tend to take that opportunity, and then when the other salespeople see it works, that's what gets the mass adoption on the on the team. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. All right. Number five: increasing. Um, average job value so let me just say a few things about this I'm gonna rattle these off quick and then we're gonna go to the next one which is a big one and uh, Justin's got a ton of information there but basically increasing your job average is about getting more money out of each sale right so some of the things to think about here are are you using financing Financing will increase not only your close rate, but it will also increase your average ticket. When you finance people, they tend to spend more monies, more money. Um, price strategy. Have you looked at your pricing? I always say, you know, it, it, you got to look at where do you fall in, in, in the market? Are you at the bottom? Are you in the middle? Or are you up at the top? At the bottom, it's hard to make money. In the middle, you can get very easily, you could get squeezed. The place you want to be is you want to be at the top. You want to be one of the most expensive companies in the market. Now, in order to do that, you better make sure to provide a ton of value. So your value has to exceed your price, right? And and you know this is a thing where most companies, um, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of companies out there are having issues making money because they don't price their jobs right and price is more of a issue with you the salesperson the owner of the company than it is with the consumer because the consumer will pay more for a better experience the consumer will pay more for a better story and i i say this all the time you are if you're the lower price provider the middle cost provider you are losing jobs to competitors that are higher priced okay let that sink in for a minute if you have a price issue i guarantee you you are losing jobs to to your competitors that have higher prices than you why do they why are they selling it and you are not they have told a better story right they had better training maybe or they or they didn't have the head trash so you got to get over that so those are some ways to increase your um, job average now this is the one let's go to number six increase rehash I'm gonna say one thing about this and then I'm gonna let Justin show you a bunch of cool stuff here's the thing what happens with most companies is that if the job's not sold, that's it. They're done. They're finished. They move on. They're never going to buy from us. They have all kinds of excuses around it. Well, I have clients that do millions of dollars a year from rehash, okay, from the people that did not buy. Now, keep in mind, rehash is not only people that you went to visit, presented to, and told you no. Rehash is also, what about all the inquiries that you didn't convert? What about, like Justin was just saying, people that canceled their appointments? That also should be thought about in terms of rehash. Justin, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely spend a little bit of time on this one. And, you know, I, I don't want to focus too much on sort of proving the, the point that it's important, but we sort of always start with is this question, a- which is, 
Hey, Justin, is that a is that a picture of your bed at home? How do you not hit your head on the headboard every night when you go to sleep? It's a, it's a future state, you know. This is what I picture in my in my head every every day. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted. I goal. couldn't help myself. Um. We, so yeah, we always kind of start with this question of, do you know how much you've spent in acquiring leads over whatever umpteen years you've been in business? Because if if you sat down and you calculated it, it's it's if you've never done it before and you Mill do it, it's going to be more than you thought. It's, Millions. It's going to be much more. And it's typically at least hundreds of thousands, and it is oftentimes millions of dollars. Like you said, some of those turn into sales, some don't. Uh, but if you've kept those leads, hopefully on a computer and not in a file somewhere, um, you know, you might come ahead, to find Justin, that this is it. your. Justin, go ahead and say it. If you kept it in Improve It 360, we well, didn't need to. We can always uh, transfer your data over, but <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a system like Improve It 360. It, the important thing is that you're you're keeping track of them. Um, and um, hey, I mean, it's not so uncommon. We've we've visited some really big operations not that long ago that they've got files stacked away. Big big operations. So you know, it's still not that uncommon. But you know, eventually you might come to find this is your biggest a asset, right? or at least your most expensive asset. It might not be on your balance sheet, but it's there. So what are people doing with that asset, right? Do they leverage it? Um, or does it just become this money under the mattress? So you know, what we see is during an economy like this that we're in today, this isn't on everybody's mind so much because there seems like there's plenty of business to go around. They're worried about getting the crews to just do the business. Um, we all know the market, market is cyclical and eventually rehashing comes back in style out of necessity. Um, the shame though is that it's just as viable a process during any market condition. It really is. You should be doing it all the time. Uh, so let's talk about that a bit. Um, now, Brian, we, we typically break this down into two terms for the process, recycle and rehash. The only difference being that we call leads that never sat for an appointment recycle and you know you rehash the leads that sat for a demo that didn't buy. That's just a slight difference that people tend to differentiate mostly for messaging purposes, but the strategy and the process is, is the same, right? Um, so what's the process? It's simple. You reach back out to them. You stay in touch with them. You nurture them in some way with email or direct mail or phone calls. Um, typically, we see a lot of rehash programs, including phone calls. Um, and they may be dedicated call reps, if not uh, just an entire call center. We've seen call centers or sections of call centers just dedicated to rehash. Um, how well does it work, right? Um, one, one replacement contractor comes to mind. We did a case study with them. Uh, they started doing this in earnest with these recycled and rehash leads. Um, and very quickly, it became 22% uh, of their total revenue. And like you said, wow. it's, it's millions of dollars. 22% of their total revenue was just coming from this kind of rehash recycle operation. Um, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to circle back around. You, our last point was about your job size, right? Increasing that. An interesting component of this process was about the average job size. Um, they found that when they looked at the average sales price of the recycled and the rehashed leads compared to the, the brand new leads that just went right through and, and purchased, the average size of the recycle and rehash were higher. For the recycle in particular, the leads that never even sat for an appointment originally, it was a 21% increase on the average job size. So why did that happen, right? Um, what they found was happening was that even if a prospective homeowner was serious about a purchase, sometimes they were uneducated on cost or more often than not, if you're like me, they're just so thorough in their research. They're accustomed to taking their time because for these important decisions on how they invest their money, that's just, that's their, in their nature, right? Um, and they're not going to be rushed. But that's a great buyer that you really want because this company, you know, they became that trusted brand that just stayed in touch 
um, and even went out of their way to help educate these prospective buyers as they became more comfortable with all these different aspects of the purchase, the pricing, with the company's specific product options, with the benefit of certain choices of products over others. So when the time came on you know, that good, better, or best option, these customers were more likely to choose the better or best. So we just found that to be a super interesting dynamic with the homeowner market. Um, and another reason the data shows that rehash works. It just works. Yeah, that's interesting. Wow, cool. All right. So the last one here, this one's kind of my favorite because, you know, kind of my whole business, but increase referrals and repeat business. This is a huge area of opportunity that most companies, especially in a market like, you know, in an economy like we're in, in a market like we're in now, you know, everything is good. People are selling jobs like crazy, but it's not always going to be this way. And the more that you can do now to leverage the relationship or develop that relationship with your customers, um, the better it's going to be for you today, right? You'll be more profitable today, but also in the future, these are the people that you're going to rely on to drive your business. Because if you don't have this component in your business and you're only relying on new, new, new Google home shows, um, uh, canvassing, whatever, you know, when the economy turns, which it will, we all know it will, it's not doom and gloom, it's just reality. Um, those are the first things that are gonna get hit. And so this, you know, increasing referrals and, and repeat business is, is really critical. Um, what have you got to, to, you know, from your experience, and then if you, guys, if you don't mind, I'll just show a little bit about how we do it. For, yeah. for our clients. Yeah, Brian, I know that you're you're the expert in this area. I'm going to defer to you. And I, I had a few different items to talk about, but I know we're we're running short on time, so um, I'll, I'll give you the lion's share of this. What I'll just mention is, is you've got this flywheel here. Um, I, I just want to point out there was a recent article on Harvard Business Review called "Replacing the Sales Funnel with the Sales Flywheel," and the analogy is around a flywheel, right? In like a steam engine where you know, this powered the industrial revolution, this invention that was really highly efficient at capturing, storing, and then releasing energy when needed. Um, and then the analogy is applied to our business. It's about how adding operational components that apply force to this flywheel and keep it spinning, the output is typically exactly this, repeat and referral business. And it's something that you have to consider along the, the entire cycle, but it, it's captured at the end point. It's captured. You want to release that energy. You're building up this energy so that you can release it at the end. You have to have the mechanisms to release it to get the output. And I think that that's what you're going to talk about. Um, what I'll mention real quickly for repeat is, you know, the, the business I was just talking about that had the rehash program, they use that exact same structure uh, and kind of tool set um, for their repeat program. Um, repeat business became 19% of their total revenue, right? They, they were kind of, a little bit of a different take on it, but really they were using some of the same tools and overhead. Um, and referrals, we all know they work. You're, you, you probably have some pretty uh, complex and really cool stuff out there, but even just simple stuff, Brian, um, there is a, a company that's been really successful with the systemization of things. They've actually begun to franchise out. Um, but one of the first things they wanted to systemize was this referral program. They had incentives, they had things, but not, it wasn't a system. It wasn't, and it wasn't a system because it wasn't trackable. They, they couldn't see that it was happening. They just set up a simple system to make sure that it was like a three-step call process. That's all it was. It was phone calls. Uh, it was nothing fancy, um, but they made sure that it was done consistently. There was a system to it. They added an additional 350000 monthly in sales from that, yeah. from phone calls, right? A little yeah. over four mil a year. Their referrals moved from 2% of their overall uh, to 22%, I think, um, in just two yep. years' time. And that's, that's as about as simple as you can get, not to mention emails and texts and physical mail and all the other strategies. So I'll leave it up to you because I know that that's definitely your No, idea. that's awesome. No, no, that's awesome. So um, what I'll just say about that is, is just a few things. First off, it's, this is an enormous opportunity that 
many companies are taking advantage of. And from our experience, if you want to be a healthy business, you want your repeat referral to be somewhere between 25 and 35 percent of your overall business. If you're short of that, you got that's your opportunity. That's the lost opportunity that you have, right? So healthy business, 25 to 35 percent doesn't happen overnight. Like you know, Justin, the example that Justin just gave, it takes a couple of, of years. But if you start, you know, the best time to start something is now, right? So if you start on this and you start building this and start thinking about developing um, those customer relationships, you, you know, you'll change your business pretty dramatically. So I'm just going to say a couple of quick things about it. Every, when it comes to referrals, repeat, and reviews, you know, we haven't even touched on reviews because they're not really part of the seven, although they do, they will help convert more sales. They will help you get more inquiries. Um, but reviews, referrals, repeat, um, re relationship, rehash, all of that does, does not happen unless you provide an amazing customer experience. And in today, you've got to do everything you can to take just that ordinary customer and convert them into a raving fan. To me, and I won't go into the whole thing, but to me, a satisfied customer is a liability. If a company says to me that their uh, customers are satisfied, to me, that's a liability. What you want to do is have a system in place that creates raving fans. Right. And the way to do that is really the simple way to do that is to look at every interaction point that you have, every touch point you have with a customer and just ask yourself the simple question. How do we make them say wow at this point? And wow in a good way, not in a bad way. How do we make them say wow at this point? Um, it's not that hard to stand out from the competition, uh, but most people aren't doing it. And if it's done effectively, Customer experience will drive more referrals and word of mouth, more repeat business, premium pricing, and more online reviews. Now, just real quickly, the way that we do it for our client is based for our clients is based on four pillars. Okay, and the four pillars are this is it. There's no other way. You know, how the 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 tactics inside of them may change. But the pillars are the pillars, and they are one is appreciation, saying thank you after the job has been completed. Two is getting feedback and working on that feedback and obviously driving to reviews. Third is having a formal, robust referral program. And number four is just keeping in touch, staying in touch with your customer to remain top of mind with them those are the four pillars i won't go into all of the parts and pieces that's what you know that's what we do for that's what we execute on for our clients at g4 and um these are the this is what we know works all right so justin i think we've covered a lot we've gone over on time just a little bit but those are the seven profit multipliers uh, people are coming into the room now, so I'm going to have to go here in a minute. But this is something that I learned from my mentor a long time ago. Hey, guys, can you? Hey, guys, keep it down a little bit. Down a little bit. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, but I got this from my mentor years and years ago, and he said, little hinges swing big doors. And the way to think about these seven profit multipliers is – um, that these are little hinges that can swing big doors um, for you. Um, so, um, Justin, um, Improve It 360, you want to do a quick little pitch for Improve It 360? Sure, I do. Yeah, I mean, in case you don't know who we are or you haven't gathered what we do, we're um, uh, Improve 360 is a CRM and kind of operations platform. It's just for uh, home improvement uh, companies, replacement contractors, especially contractors, remodelers, and some other um, niches. And, you know, we, we kind of focus on trying to be this all-in-one system, um, and that includes sort of a hub-and-spoke model where we 
integrate a lot of tool sets together. That's going to be a big focus for us this year. But and it's everything from the marketing and sales side of things. We do a lot with mobile apps kind of geared towards the sales reps, quoting all the way through the projects. Um, and then, you know, a big, big, big focus for us are all these reports and business intelligence. Because when you have that string of data that goes all the way from the first time somebody heard about you until they're, you know, repeating business with you or giving you referrals, um, the amount of business intelligence you can get uh, that will show you kind of these levers to pull when and where um, is is amazing. So, you know, if you guys don't have a system like this in place, you can, you can check us out. Uh, we tend to deal with... Um, Companies that go a little bit upstream that have some some scale already, but you know, we love to talk to you either way. I put my email in there if anybody wants to even just talk shop. Um, I'm I'm always open, so hit me up and we'll cool. uh, we'll talk about whatever you want. Cool. So hey, look before um, before we sign off, I just want to make sure we answer these questions. So here's a good one about rehab. Um, with Rehash, how do you avoid the word getting out on the internet that if you are a prospect of this company to wait for a bit and they'll call you back with a better price at a later date? Um, don't always offer a better price. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's my best <laughs> advice on that. Easy. Uh, don't don't Easy. be that guy that says, oh, well, if you do it now, we'll give you an additional 20% off. And that's not, that's lazy. Uh, that doesn't work. Um, will we be able to share the PowerPoint? We will share the uh, video recording. Um, Larry, uh, Larry's a great client. It's been a client for years and years. He said, amazing timing, gents. Not sure what that means, but I'll tell you, if, if uh, Larry probably took some of this stuff and already went and made a whole bunch of money. That's how he is. Um, okay. Is Improve It 360 software a tool to manage inventory, order, scheduling, and other tasks, or is it strictly intended from the management of leads? Not really um, inventory. That's not something we have right now. Certainly schedule. I mean, certainly scheduling. Scheduling is a core kind of focus for us hey, for both yeah. the sales side and the project side. Greg, uh, the question came from Greg. Greg, I would ju I'd call jo Justin, and I would. Um, show him specifically uh, what you are um, thinking about and see if that's something they can offer. Um, I would like to have, uh, will it be, a bit? yes, John, it will be available to watch later. He says he has several other people in his office that he would like to watch. How soon after the demo do you recommend rehashing? Yes, next day, um, start right away. Um, by the way, the next day is a happy call. It's just, hey, um, I'm, I'm calling, um, our rep was in your house last night. Can I just ask you a few questions about your experience? Was he on time? Was he professional? You know, that whole thing. Um, somebody just said, thank you. Um, I've used three, I360 since the inception of my business and they have been one of the best partners in growing my business. Look at that. That's from Brian Diamond. Cool. Hey, Brian, All right. what's going on? So um, those are questions. Um, if it's okay, what I'm going to do is let me just put a poll up here. If anybody's interested in meeting with us at G4 or even um, um, if you want to meet with Justin, we'll pass your information along to him. Um, but just fill out the poll for us here real quick. I'm going to leave that up there for a minute. And um, I don't see any other questions, Justin. Um, thank you. I, I think that I think we provided a ton of value to the listeners. We'll have to let them, you know, let us know if we did or we did not. Um, but uh, got the poll open a little bit longer. Come on, people, hit the button, hit the button, and I'll close the poll out. Okay, there we go. More people, more people. Hit the poll. Let us know. Let us know. I'm just waiting. You okay there, Justin? Sorry. I'm just waiting for everybody to finish the poll. <laughs> All right, I'm going to close it here in just a second. Five, 
four, three, two, one. All right. All right, everybody. Justin, thank you, my friend. I will talk to you soon. Um, let me put thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Brian. Justin's information back up on the screen. Um, but you'll get follow-up emails. We'll post the, the replay of this. Justin and I are both very easy to find. Find us. We can both help you grow your business. That's what we are here for. Um, with that said, bye, everybody. Um, talk to you all soon. Thanks, Justin. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.